So we're going to be running a cross-site scripting attack, but the idea is that certain requests are blocked by a web application firewall. So in order to solve this lab, we're going to be making use of Burp's intruder feature in order to try out different payloads to see if we can get any of those payloads past the firewall. All right, without further ado, let's take a look at the lab. So we can see that we have the ability to search the blog and it's this particular input that's vulnerable to cross-site scripting. However, if we try a regular cross-site scripting payload, for example, it could be something like image source equals zero, on error equals alert. Let's search for this payload and we can see we get the response tag is not allowed. In other words, this particular tag, the image tag has been blocked by the web application firewall. Our HTTP request is not even hitting the web application because it's been filtered out. Now, just because one tag is being filtered out, that doesn't mean that everything is being filtered out. For example, if I just try the angle brackets themselves, these are evidently not being filtered out by the web application firewall. And we may find that certain elements are also not being filtered. For example, we find that the body tag is not being filtered. So if I search for this, we can see that the request goes through. So it may still be possible to run a cross-site scripting attack we just need to make use of tags which are not filtered out by the firewall. Now we jumped ahead slightly there because we automatically knew that the body tag was not going to be filtered by the firewall. The question is, how did we figure that out in the first place? And the answer is we can make use of Burp's intruder feature to brute force all of the available elements. So let's see how that works. What we're looking at right now is our initial request where we tried a generic cross-site scripting payload and we got the response that tag wasn't allowed because we we're making use of this image tag. Now, if we right click on this request, we can send it to the intruder. Notice the intruder tab flashes up orange. Let's navigate to the intruder tab and we can see the initial request that we sent. The first step here is to make use of this option, clear payload markers. And that symbol there refers to a payload marker and a payload marker is where we're going to inject our payload as part of a brute force attack. Now, in this case, we only need one payload marker. We can see our search string here. The idea is we're going to have an open and close angle bracket. And then inside those angle brackets, we want to iterate through different types of tag to see if any of them can bypass the web application firewall. I'm simply going to click this option, add payload marker, we can now see a payload marker between the two angle brackets. Now we need a list of different tags that we can iterate through as part of this brute force attack. Heading back to portswigger.net, we can see that they provide a cross-site scripting cheat sheet and it's possible to copy all of the tags to the clipboard. I'm just going to make use of this option, copy tags to clipboard. If we head back to burp, we can now define the list of payloads that Burp will iterate through. And we can simply click paste in this payload settings area. And we now see all of those copied tags appear in this simple list. The idea now is that when we click start attack, Burp Intruder is going to try every single one of these tags as part of a brute force attack. Let's click start attack. We can see the attacks going through. Now the idea is if a request is filtered out by the web application firewall, we get a 400 response. However, if it's not filtered out by the web application firewall, we get our regular 200 response. So we've ordered this list by status and we can see that we're getting a couple of 200 responses. Let's focus on this response. And we can see that when the body tag was used as a value of that search parameter, we're getting a 200 response from the web app. In other words, body tag is not being filtered by the web application firewall. We knew this to begin with, but this is how we arrive at that conclusion that we can make use of the body tag. Now, the idea is we usually combine a tag with a specific event listener in order to generate a cross-site scripting attack vector. In other words, we do something like body, then we might say on load equals, and then we pass in our JavaScript Let's see what happens when we search for this. And we can see attribute is not allowed. In other words, it's saying it's okay with the body tag. We've already checked that, but this onload event handler or this onload attribute, it's being filtered out by the web application firewall. 
So we can now run through the same process again to understand which attributes we can work with which are not filtered by the web application firewall. So here we are once again back at Intruder. We're going to modify our request slightly and iterate over a different payload set. So we know we're going to be making use of the body tag because it's not filtered. And then the idea is we have some kind of event listener. Now we're going to include the URL encoded space, which is percent %20. Then we're going to have our payload marker. This is going to represent our iterated list of different attributes. We'll add the payload marker. Then we're going to say equals, and then we can just provide some type of arbitrary value for the value of this attribute. So we'll just say equals one for now. Now we need a different list this time. Remember our previous list was iterating through tags, whereas now we want to iterate through events. So let's choose the option, copy events to clipboard from the Portswigger cross-site scripting cheat sheet. Let's now head back to Intruder and let's head to the payloads tab. We can now clear our previous list and we can now paste our new list of event attributes. Now let's choose start attack. And once again, we're looking for 200 responses because anytime we get that 400 response, it means that our HTTP request has been filtered out by the firewall. Now we see there's actually a few event listener attributes that we can make use of. We have on before input, on rate change, on resize, and on scroll end. Now we'll just return briefly to the lab guidelines. The objective is not simply to launch a cross-site scripting attack. The idea is to perform a cross-site scripting attack that doesn't result from any user interaction with the page. Notice it says here, your solution must not require any user interaction. Returning to the list of different event listeners we have access to, the problem we have here is that all of these require some level of user interaction. On before input event is triggered when user is about to type something into a form. On rate change has to do with changing the playback speed of a video. On resize is when the page gets resized. And on scroll end is when an element has reached the bottom of its scroll window. To give you an example of how this needs user interaction, let's focus on that on resize event listener. Let's head back to our lab. So instead of on load, which is going to be filtered by the firewall, let's change this to on resize. And the guidelines for the lab tell us we need to make use of the print JavaScript method. So let's search for this. We know it's not going to be filtered by the firewall, but as you can see, no cross-site scripting is launched here. We don't have that print window pop up. Having said that, what happens if we resize this page? All of a sudden, the cross-site scripting attack is initiated. Now, ideally, in order to automate this, so it doesn't require user interaction such as resizing the page, and this is still a valid cross-site scripting attack, by the way. This is still a vulnerability in the way the page works because a certain percentage of users are obviously going to resize the page. But cross-site scripting is always considered more efficient if there's no user interaction required. And that's why we often make use of event listeners such as on load. So we could say as soon as the body has loaded, then the cross-site scripting attack is executed. But of course, that particular event listener on load has been blocked by the web application firewall. So the question is, is there a way around this? And the answer is yes, although it does slightly change the attack surface. And the answer has to do with rendering this page inside an iframe. And the idea is if we render it inside an iframe on an attacker controlled page, then we can actually resize that iframe on page load. The cross-site scripting attack will be executed automatically without any needed input from the victim. So it's a slightly different attack because it does require the victim to visit that attacker controlled page. The plus side is that the cross-site scripting attack is executed automatically on this particular page, although this particular page will now be loaded inside an iframe. Now the lab provides facility for us to create that iframe with this option, go to exploit server. So let's take a quick look at this payload, which now resides inside an iframe. So the source attribute of the iframe is the lab. And notice we have as part of the query string, this search parameter, we have URL encoded left angle bracket, body tag space, on resize event listener equals print, 
then we close with the right angle bracket. But since this iframe is being rendered on an attack controlled page, at least in theory, then we can make use of this onload attribute. So remember when we were trying to inject that into the lab itself, it's blocked by the web application firewall. But now within the context of an attacker controlled page, we can naturally make use of the onload event on the iframe. Notice what happens when we make use of this onload event, this dot style dot width equals hundred pixels. In other words, the iframe, as soon as it's loaded, it's immediately being resized. That's then going to trigger the on resize event because that's the attribute attached to this injected body tag in the page. All of a sudden, we now have a cross-site scripting attack vector without any user interaction. As mentioned, the drawback is we now have to get the victim to visit the attacker controlled page. So key takeaways for this lab, just because some tags are blocked doesn't mean they're all blocked. And it's possible to use Burp's intruder feature to cycle through a list of different tags to find out which return a 200 response. You'll notice if you're using the community edition of Burp Suite that the intruder HTTP requests are throttled and will take a longer period of time. That's because simply flooding a web application with a high quantity of HTTP requests can be enough to create a denial of service attack. It could potentially take the web app offline. And you'll see if you are participating in bug bounty programs that sometimes these types of brute force attack or automated attacks are actually out of scope because it could potentially be damaging to the web app itself. Now, assuming a fairly big enterprise with high throughput capabilities for their web app, then making use of Burp Intruder is not going to be a big deal. But there's obviously a reason why Intruder is throttled in the community edition. It's something that has to be used with a fair amount of caution. Make sure what you're doing is in scope and it's legal. And just be aware of the implications of flooding a web app with a high quantity of HTTP requests in a very short space of time. That being said, this lab was mostly about using Burp's Intruder feature to bypass web application firewall. Thanks very much for watching, guys. Hope it was helpful.